Yo, what's good? My name is Reginald, aka the R Star, aka Mrs. Dre Fire, and this is Unabashedly Reggie's review, breakdown, analysis to Eminem's verse on Ed Sheeran's Remember the Name. Before we start, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. As always, if you don't want to hear info about the song or my review, check the description to find time codes to skip to the breakdown part. And if you like the audio version only of this video, check out my SoundCloud page, but you can also find it on Anchor and most of your podcast services. All links can be found in the description below. Remember the name was released on July 12, 2019. It is the eighth track of Ed Sheeran's fourth studio album, Number Six Collaborations Project. This song also features 50 Cent. This is the second collaboration between Ed Sheeran and Eminem, but the first collaboration between 50 and Sheeran. Also, the first collab between 50 and Slim in seven years. The last time they appeared on the same track, it was on 50's My Life, also featuring Adam Levine in 2012. But back to Remember the Name, it was mostly produced by Sheeran and producer Max Martin in Sweden. In an interview with Charlemagne the God, which you can find on Sheeran's YouTube channel, he explains how the song came about. He was recording the song in Sweden with Max Martin and said the line, give me a song with Eminem and 50 Cent in the club as a way to wish his dream collab into existence. So he was hoping for another song with Eminem for his project and was going to ask M to ask 50 to be on the song as well. Next thing you know, when Ed was set to perform in London with Eminem, 50 Cent was also backstage and that's how they made the song happen. Fun fact, that meeting happened the day after Kamikaze was released, which explains why Eminem in the song is still on that energy of not wanting to quit rap no matter what. As the title says, the song is about an artist's legacy. Both Ed and Am reflect on the fact that they're actually coming from humble beginnings and made it to the top of their game. Now here's my quick review of the song. You may not know this, but Ed Sheeran is actually one of my favorite artists, and I do appreciate when he does his rapping. I think Ed is one of the best writers today. Don't be fooled by the fact that his music is mainstream, proof of that, Eminem wouldn't have such respect for him if it wasn't the case. I really love his verse, throughout he did alliterations and consonants with the S sound and assonances with the it sound, so that I thought I was dope. Plus he had that cool little simile with stick to singing, stop rapping like it's Christmas, where rapping not only as in being a rapper but also as in rapping gifts. Not an incredible wordplay, but well crafted within the rhyme scheme. And one last thing about Ed's verse, I found it ironic that he talked about how he doesn't want the conversation to be about money but 50's verse is all about money, which leads me to 50 Cent's verse. 50 Cent's verse was good in terms of flow and he did more complex rhyme than he usually does, but I have to say it was very disappointing in terms of substance. Both Ed and M talked about their come up, but he did some generic money talk with his cars and the hoes that he spoils. Come on, it's such a missed opportunity to do an introspective verse looking back at his career. He could have talked about being shot nine times, surviving it, being dropped by Columbia Records, becoming one of the biggest rapper and mogul in hip hop history, and destroying careers. Ja! Or even talk about how although people say that he fell off, they'll always remember in the club, and hence his name. But no, instead we had generic ass bullshit. That was an it, chief. Now nah, Hems verse. Some people are disappointed because they felt he could have gone harder. But there, here's the thing, not every verse Every song needs to be super hard. I like a more laid back verse, especially when it fits the song. Still, I think this verse is good. I love the first few bars because he creates a nice melody with his delivery. It's not one of his best verse, but it's still very pleasant to listen to. Can you imagine an album where he rapped like on Homicide on every song? It wouldn't be good. So that's why I appreciate diversity even when he does guest spots. But what I'll say is the ending could have been better. I felt like it stopped as it was getting momentum. Maybe he could have added another four bars to have a better conclusion. But to be radio friendly, I think he stuck to the 16 bars format. So that was my take on his verse. But before I get into M's verse breakdown, I want to talk about the hook. I think Ed Sheeran wanted to capture that early 2000 vibe with M and 50, and I think he succeeded. And to me, it's mostly due to how it feels like a Nate Dogg type of hook, rest in peace. So it feels very nostalgic. And on top of that, you have those high pitched synth that gives a West Coast feel. It actually sounds like a Dre track, if you ask me. Plus, Head himself said he wrote a hook that would sound like a 50 hook and I think it actually does. And I love how the hook changed a bit and had M's voice layered on top of Ed Sheeran and 50's vocals. Very catchy hook. Now, on to the verse. I can still remember trying to shop a deal from Taco Bell to TRL. I climbed the billboard charts to the top until, as fate would have it, became an addict. Funny, cause I had pop appeal. Here, M talks about how he started from nothing, trying to shop around his demos from Infinite to the Slim Shady EP, and how he became a chart-topping artist. TRL Total Request Live is a place where Eminem used to get a lot of hugs. Got that? 
Well, it's an MTV video countdown show where the fans vote for what they want to see. It's credited to have jumpstarted the careers of many late 90s, early 2000 artists, such as Britney Spears, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Christina Aguilera, and of course, Eminem, something M has acknowledged in the past. Plus, when the show ended in 2008, before being revived in 2017, they made the final top 10 countdown of their most iconic videos, and M's The Real Slim Shady was number two, right behind Britney Spears' Baby One More Time. So that tells you the impact that M had on that show. Not only does Taco Bell fit the rhyme scheme, did you know that tacos are M's favorite food? To the point where you could say that he's actually addicted to Taco Bell. In an interview of Hot Ones, Tony Yeo of G-Unit said, Every time we're around M and we're backstage, there's Taco Bell everywhere. Now, on a sad note, M told Rolling Stone magazine that after Proof passed away, he was battling with Taco Bell and McDonald's addiction. He said this, I was going to McDonald's and Taco Bell every day. The kids behind the counter knew me. It wouldn't even phase them. Or I'd sit up at Denny's or Big Boar and just eat myself. It was sad. I got so heavy that people started to not recognize me. But on a funnier note, here's a video of M a couple weeks after the Marshall Mathers LP dropped in 2000 where he eats at a Taco Bell and complains that there's no mouth sauce. You wanna wrap it down? Mmm, <laughs> excellent. Let's see your sauces. You only got hot? No, no, no. What's in your mouth? Man, you're f***ing up, man. You're f***ing up. You're f***ing up. You're f***ing up, man. You're slipping, man. <laughs> See what I gotta deal with? Shot Britney Spears out without we had my own sauce sitting here. <laughs> but you wouldn't be as high on the charts, so look at it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I keep forgetting about that. It's crazy. It's a big cultural shift going on, I think. Yeah. Maybe Slim Shady can be the beginning of the end of pop music. <laughs> if I was fucking Britney Spears, I would have mouth sauce sitting here. I was funny, but moving on. In that last line, there's a cool wordplay through the use of homophones. Homophones are two or more words pronounced alike, but different in meanings or spelling. Here, it's pop appeal, which hides pop appeal, as in doing drugs. And that goes with became an addict. So what I really loved about those first four bars is that he was able to sum up his careers in so few words. And when he says, as fate would have it, he means that a lot of time when people become super successful and famous, they have a hard time dealing with their own fame and sometimes will fall into the dark pit of drug addictions. So going back to the pop appeal wordplay, he's acknowledging that he's had success because of his look, being white and having a blonde mop that's on top of his fucked up head, which led him to being pop. And the reason why he says funny right before is because he finds it ironic that the success from his pop appeal made him pop appeal. On to the next lines. But they said time would tell if I'd prevail. Alliteration of T's here, they said time would tell. And all I did was put nine inch nails in my eyelids. Now I'm seeing diamond sales like common sales. What a better way to talk about his early career than referencing the opening line of his first hit. Of course, I'm talking about the nine inch nails in the eyelid from My Name Is. And what I love about Anne being on a song called Remember the Name is the fact that Marshall introduced himself to the world by telling us his name, Freddy Cool Connection. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in the first half of the verse, he does ad libs in the style of My Name's ad libs with the what, uh huh, where. <laughs> nice touch. Now, that could totally just be a me thing, but the way he said, and all I did was reminded me of Medicine Man when he said, all I did was say what I'm feeling when the vocal book calls. And in both occurrences, he was talking about how people doubted he was going to be successful. Zales Jewelers is an American jewelry retailer chain. That is the reason why M made that simile, since he was talking about diamond sales. It's not necessarily a brilliant simile, but it's how he built his rhyming towards that. Tom Mattel, I Prevail, Nine Inch Nails, Diamond Sales, and I'm in Zales. When I see stuff like that, I'm always wondering if he came up with the line like I'm in Zales first and rolled backwards, or it naturally fitted the scheme as he was writing. Maybe one day I'll get the chance to ask him. One day, one day. And finally, I like the sort of oxymoron he did, because if you were to actually stick nails in your eyelids, you probably wouldn't be able to see due to the massive amount of blood that would be dropping from your eyes. So he had to stick nails in his eyes in order to see the diamond sales. So you see the contradiction? Anyways, I thought that was interesting writing. And speaking of diamond sales, M is the only rapper with two diamond certified albums. A diamond certification means that you've sold over 10 million albums in the United States. As for Slim, those albums would be the Marshall Mathers LP with around 11 million sales and the Eminem Show, my favorite album of all time, with around 10.6 million sales. Let's continue. 
without a doubt by any means. If rap was skinny jeans, I couldn't do anything in them. I'd be spitting seams of denim, winnem, spitting schemes, which really means no if, ands, or buts are squeezing in between. Before I go deeper into the meaning of those lines, I just want to point out the things that relate to jeans. First, you have seams, which are the stitchings on a pair of jeans. Denim, which is the fabric with what jeans are made of. And finally, it uses the expression no if, ands, or buts with a homophone. That would be but and butt with two T's as in an actual ass that couldn't fit in a skinny jeans. And if you didn't know, no if, ands, or buts is an expression that means to be certain of something or simply not making any excuses. You also use that expression in Not Afraid, if you recall. So what does M really mean when he says if frap was skinny jeans? Well, skinny jeans are a style of jeans that is often associated with the new school of rappers. In the 90s and early 2000s, rappers were wearing jeans that were baggy or looser. But back to the new school of rappers, what do we often say about today's rap? That when it comes to lyrics, the standards have completely gone down for the most part, which helped the rise of mumble rap, a type of rap M has criticized a lot recently, especially in Kamikaze. Therefore, I think that when he says if rap was skinny jeans, M is suggesting that if the true form of rap was defined by today's lyrical standards and lack of focus on writing skills, M couldn't fit in the game because his rhyming and spitting is too advanced and too complex. So that's the metaphor behind those lines. Furthermore, no if, ands, or buts, which I've said can mean making no excuses, in the context of this metaphor, it can also mean that no matter what, even when M made mainstream songs, he didn't use it as an excuse to lower his writing standards. He never made any compromise to who he is as an MC, because often rappers who focus on making mainstream music will use it as an excuse for writing simplistic, lesser bars. You sleep on me because you're only fucking with me in your dreams. The metaphor here is with sleep and dreams. To sleep on someone is a slang that means that you don't pay attention to something or simply look down or assume something isn't good. And if you've heard the Kamikaze album, you know that M felt recently he had been overlooked, that he'd been slept on by critics and also rappers. So the reason he gives the rappers for thinking this way is because they know they can only compete with him lyrically, that would be what fucking with means, they can only do it in their dreams, so that's why they choose to sleep on M. Final lines. Not even when I'm on my deathbed, man, I feel like Ed, it isn't time to drop the mic yet. So why would I quit? The thought that I would stop when I'm dead just popped in my head. I said it and then forgot what I said. The deathbed line continues the previous line where rappers can't fuck with him, not even if he was old and dying. And quite frankly, I'd rather be an 80 year old M than a 20 year old, oh, you know who. I feel like Ed, it isn't time to drop the mic yet. That's a reference to the lines in Ed Sheeran's verse where he talked about people wanting him to stop rapping. Ed's verse was already recorded when he presented the song to Eminem and often Slim makes a reference to what the artist has said when he does a feature. And I always like that because it makes you feel that the guest artist is trying to connect with the song and that he wrote the verse specifically for that song. Like in Lucky You, M's intro was similar to Joyner's intro because Joyner had recorded the song for himself originally. And finally, he ends the song by saying that he'll never stop rapping. He first thought that he would stop when he would be dead, like in Nowhere Fast, when he said, will I ever fall off that they will never come to the pine box, but then changed his mind and says that he'll continue even when he's dead. How is that possible? Well, his legacy will go on. As they say, no one truly dies until their name is spoken for the last time. And for years to come after his death, they'll remember the name because his spirit will live on through his lyrics that you hear in his song. That's it folks, that was my review, breakdown, analysis, the Eminem's verse on Ed Sheeran's Remember the Name. If you like to support the channel, go check out my Patreon by clicking somewhere here or checking the links below. And as for my next video, well, the day before I recorded this video, there was a snippet of an Eminem verse on a song of Conway the Machine, that's a Buffalo rapper who was signed to Shady Records in 2017 along its brother, Westside Gun. But until then, this has been Unabashed Reggie. Thanks, it's been real.